usually sit up. I used. I guess I can sit on that side if you want, Cody. Morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Board of County Commissioners meeting. As always, we like to start with a prayer reading or a thought and the Pledge of Allegiance. And we look to the audience for participation for those who would like to uh, participate with us. So if you would, um, turn it up. I think it's, is it up just as high as it goes? Is that better? Okay. Are there any volunteers for the prayer, reading your thought, and to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge? Do the prayer? Okay, would you just come on up, state your name, and then we'll, we'll start with you. My name is Clea Harris. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to gather together this morning to be able to participate in government, to be able to um, see the process of how we live in a free country that is able to um, communicate with our leaders, that we are able to vote. And we're grateful for the children here today and for their interest and enthusiasm to see um, those who've been called to lead them. We're grateful and we ask for thy spirit to be in this room as we um, advocate for each other and for what's best for our community. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it's great having all these students here. We don't usually have that many young people here, especially on a day of school. <laughs> Must be a field trip. Um, we're going to start with a public hearing. And this public hearing is uh, for the proposal of the Shauna Lynn Phelps uh, property subdivision. And we'll have staff come up and talk about, uh, um, uh, about what the proposal is. And then, as a public a public hearing, all all comments are welcome. So if you'd like to come up and, and speak to it, you you're more than likely you, you can just come up to the podium and state your name. We'll start with Brandon. Okay. Yeah, Brandon Larson, Community Development Staff. Um, Monty and and Shauna Phelps have been working on an, an application. Um, essentially, they want to build a new home in an area that's landlocked. There's no road access to it, and so. They are working to extend 6200 West uh, near 8800 South. And the process to do that's a little complicated. Um, so they, ha they have, uh, well, I'll say it this way, 6200 West, the portion that they want to extend uh, runs through three subdivision lots right now, lots three through five of, of Phelps Platte B. And um, that it dead ends, dead ends into a hammerhead uh, close to the middle of, of, of lot three. So their proposal is to extend uh, 6200 West uh, to give access to, to that land lo landlocked piece to the north. The problem we run into there is that, that you can't have a cul-de-sac inside a subdivision. So what, what they're proposing is to take 6200 West to the very north limit of, of, of the subdivision, of Phelps subdivision, reconfigure lots three through five to kind of realign the road 
uh, a little bit to, to meet their development uh, plans. But essentially, you've got this extended road that comes to the north, and then just immediately outside of the subdivision, they're going to have a cul-de-sac uh, cul fold. And in, in uh, 2016, they came before this body and uh, presented their, their proposal, particularly, particularly uh, the uh, road extension application, because again, this, the Phelps, uh, their development plans include two proposals, one the extension, uh, a road extension application, and then this, this uh, plat. So um, when they came here in 2016, uh, they, uh, the county uh, seemed interested in, in working with, with the Phelps but uh, basically the item was continued without date to let them develop their plans a little, a little more. So they've been working with our office to uh, get a, a subdivision uh, plat amendment application uh, prepared and they've, they've done that. And so that one, a couple, the reason why we're having uh, this public hearing is because of, of two reasons. They, Part of their application includes a, a vacation of a small portion of 6200 West because they're realigning uh, the road to a, a bit. So they, they would be vacating about a tenth of an acre of roadway, but in the process, the county would be gaining six tenths of an acre and uh, even more outside of the subdivision. So um, it, and it looks some like utilities a, too, right? What's that now? U utilities as well. Yes, there, there, there are utility easements that would be vacated. And a small portion of Lot 5 would, would also be vacated through this process. Uh, the applicants have, have been working with the utility companies to, to make them aware of the process. Um, they've been working with Highline Canal, and I, uh, the Phelps might be able to talk a little more about the, where they're at in the process with, with Highline. I've, I've been trying to, to get a, an updated statement from them um, and, and haven't got that yet, but I know that they've been as I understand, they've been doing work on this uh, proposal uh, even as early as last or as recent as last week. So they're working with them. Uh, the power company uh, gave us a statement, but the scope of their letter was limited to the vacation of the of the road and didn't address the whole plat amendment. And that, that was a bit of a concern for staff. They they seemed a bit hesitant to, to make a, a comment on the on the entire uh, entirety of the, the plat amendment. So um, nonetheless, they, they, have, they are aware of this proposal. Uh, Dominion Energy also was made aware of this proposal and expressed no concerns uh, ab about the, de uh, the development proposal. So um, that's uh, kind of where we're at. I, I, it looks like, uh, with, with the exception of perhaps uh, uh, it, it might be wise to get an updated statement from SESD that addresses the entire entirety of their, uh, how, how should I say it? it? It might be wise for SESD to provide an updated statement that, that isn't just limited to the vacation of the road that actually addresses the plat amendment. Um, other than that, it looks like they've submitted a complete application, so. And Brandon, as I look down through it, it looks like all interested parties are in agreement with this and have signed off on it. Uh, correct. So there are uh, three different uh, property interests, uh, and, and they've all signed the application, signed the petition for, for the amendment, and, and so it appears that everybody's on board. So, okay. Thank you. Phelps, would you like to comment? You can. Shauna and Monty Phelps. Hi. I guess, do you want to know what Strawberry Highline Canal is in the process of doing at this point? My husband can explain it all to you. Sure. Yeah, we're, where we're going over, where the road's going to go over, uh, there's two irrigation pipes that service a property to the east of us, and uh, we're pretty much all but done. Uh, we tore out the old pipe, put in a new heavier pipe and then we sleeved both pipes and we had to lower lower one of them uh, because of the way uh, the hillside the road would be cut in on the west side so anyway um, we're pretty much all but done other than uh, filling it back in and compaction I talked to Jay this morning from Highline and he said anytime uh, he could <laughs> provide the letter now that we're at this point anyway So, so our, our purpose is to, so we, 
we bought the property in uh, 1989, and um, we did a small subdivision about 20 years ago, and uh, <clears throat> we have 30 acres still, and we're interested in doing uh, agritourism there with a you pick uh, sweet cherries and peaches, raspberries and apples is our motive, and so we are, with the extension of this road, hopefully going to get a building permit on a 30-acre parcel that we that we own. So that's that's where we're heading. Seems pretty clean to me. I don't know if the commissioners have any other questions. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Any other any other comments? If you'd like, you can please just come on up to the microphone. State your name. I received this letter in the mail and an invitation to be here. I'm one of the neighbors. I wasn't aware of this. I was just wondering, could you show me where the road and stuff is going to go? And I do. I do. So anyway. So my um, concern is, I didn't know if it was going to go. No, no, no. So so this road right here is going to be extended and it's going to cul-de-sac right there, and uh, then. This whole piece, so we've been so planting new orchards up in here, and we put the little uh, U pick shed there. Yeah. And anyway, so it's going to cul de sac right there, and okay, that's it. All right, so it's not. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't have anything okay. to do. Thanks. Yep. Okay, thank now, you. That's always been your worry. That I family. know. I know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. It's good to get that clarified. Rob Moore, County Attorney's Office. Just uh, the reason why Brandon brought up the issue of the uh, utilities and the utility easement, there's a state statute, uh, Utah Code 1727 a 609.5 sub 5, which basically says that we cannot impair the utility rights. So if they don't get an approval from them, <coughs> th those utility easements will remain in their current location. We don't have the ability to impair those by, by state law. So that's why it's, it is important for them to get those and, re, and to move those easements in accordance with the new road. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Okay. We will, we will close our, our public hearing then and we'll move into our, our regular agenda. On our, on our consent agenda, we have 13 items. We will, we will for, for just uh, organizational purposes, we'll move all items uh, on, that are on consent right now and also on our regular agenda to consent and then we'll pull off um, items that we'd like to discuss. Otherwise, they'll be considered on as consent. And so with the items that we have currently listed on consent. Um, I, I would like to just a little bit of clarification on two and three. And 12 and 13. Any other, other items that we have on consent that you'd like to pull off? No. No? Commissioner? No. On our listed regular agenda, um, if we could, if we could pull number one for con for uh, discussion. Number two, if I I'm suggesting that we strike that one because we have that listed again at the end. Is that okay? I, I agree. There's a duplicate there, and so and I, I think we could table the so we could strike one of them and and table table the other one. The other one. Okay, so strike number two if that's all right. Yeah. Strike number two and table number 24, is it? Yeah. I think there was another duplicate as well. There is. There's yeah. yeah, there's a couple in here. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, and we'll table number 24. Um, if we can strike number nine, as that's a duplicate. If we could hold number 10. Discussion purposes number eleven, <coughs> number eleven, as there's two agreements in there. Um, and then hold number twelve. 
and strike number 14. And I would, oh, you have. I believe 18 needs uh, tabled for a closed session. Tabled, let's table that one. That was what I had too, table that one. Number 18's tabled. And if we could hold number 19, I think that takes us to in our closed meetings. Any, any others? Okay. So is there any, any comments? And then the rest of them, the ones that we pull off, we will discuss. Um, the rest of the items we put on consent, is there any comments uh, on the, cons the ones that we move to consent? Okay, seeing none. Number, number two and three, um, uh, it's, it's not clear in our minutes, and, and I know that Sally's here now and she didn't take the minutes, so we'll have to just kind of get this information back. It's not clear in there um, when, when we went into closed session or when we came out of closed session. And so I think we need to adjust that. And then we also need to have a line on there for a signature line for the, for the chair and for the, clown, for the county auditor. If we could just kind of make mention of that when Justin comes back, kind of give him that information. Um, so, so with that, I'm wondering if we need to continue this for a week so we can get it get cleared up yeah. yeah I move that we continue that to make the cleanup modifications suggested by the chair second so there's a motion and a second to continue for two weeks because we won't be number two and number three all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. that passes three zero all right on number 12 um, I could open up three resolutions. One of them I could not open up, and and then uh, Kevin had a re his resolution. He had two of them on there, and Renee didn't didn't have a resolution. They look like they're the same resolutions, and I don't know who I'm looking to, but let's see who put this on. Let me see here. I'm wondering if. Can we substitute that one name? Because Kevin's on there twice. He has two resolutions, and Ray, Renee doesn't have one with her name on there. Can we just strike his name off and just and put it on? I think that'd be the easiest way to do it than, than continuing it. <laughs> so yeah, I move that we um, adopt resolutions as long as they're in conformity, listing the four names listed in item number 12 as deputy constables, deputy three names. Utah yeah. County constables, the three names. Second. I got a motion and a second uh, to adopt the resolutions with the changes that were mentioned. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that, that passes 3-0. Number 13 um, is to approve and authorize the commission chair to execute an acceptance of a donation. Um, and I have no problem with accepting donations. I think that's fantastic. But I think for accounting purposes, we need to have some sort of estimated market value on there so that we can we can put that into our accounting practices and we know what that 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 market value is yeah i talked to um amelia and josh about this yesterday and they'll be able to provide that um the fair market value so we can get it recorded so okay so we can accept this with just that note that right we need that documentation right okay mm -hmm. move to approve uh consent agenda item 13. a second get a motion and a second to uh to approve and authorize uh, consent item number 13 with slight modifications there. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. Okay, moving to our regular agenda is to adopt an ordinance uh, establishing an independent advisory board providing research recommendations <coughs> for the forming of uh, uh, government in Utah County. Commissioner. Yeah, I think this is an important topic to discuss today that's that's on the agenda and I think I'll provide some uh, extended introductory remarks before we have some discussion on this the form of government in Utah County my sense is there is a sense of sentiment there has been for quite some time that perhaps our form of government is not um, serving us as good as it could um, 
And I think there's kind of two strains to that, as I've spoken with a lot of voters and delegates throughout the campaign process over the last years. One, one strain of it says that there's an inherent flaw in the three-member commission model, both in that there's three and that it has both the legislative and the executive powers in the three-member commission. And I think that, and, and a group of people are concerned by that, and we can look at historical things that have happened, negative headlines that have been um, attributed to the county commission, and I share a lot, of, a lot of those sentiments and those concerns. And I, so I, I understand that, and I, and I wanna look at ways that we can improve that. There's another strain that says, you know, the three-member commission is a, is a form of government that has served many counties in Utah well and in other states, and it's great for rural counties or counties with smaller populations, but as Utah County is marching towards a million people and becoming the largest county in the state, that this form of government is not going to be ideal for a larger, more populous urban county. And I also share a lot of that sentiment. Now, throughout the campaign process, I listened, I engaged with voters, I was happy to have a debate of, okay, do we need to introduce geographic districts? Do we need to introduce um, other changes? What, do we need to change the number of elected officials? And I was always happy to, to have that conversation and, and explore this. I didn't, however, commit to a specific timeline or a specific outcome. And I wanna share with you a few reasons why I didn't. The first is, I intended to win the campaign that I was running, and so I knew that in a few short months, I would have firsthand experience. And I did not think that it would be prudent for me to solidify my views on this important topic without having on-the-job experience. And just as a little bit of an update on that, now that I've been in for a pretty short period of time, but it has informed my views. I'm glad that I did not solidify my conclusions at that point without having this chance. Another thing that I'll state here just to, uh, as an aside is that um, I think that we can talk about form of government. We also need to talk about the people who are in those seats. And I enjoy working with Commissioner Lee and Commissioner Ivey. I think that the county is in good hands. And I think that regardless of what we have take place in this conversation of form of government, we can work every day together to make improvements to the effectiveness of, of our county government. But that doesn't eliminate the need to have this conversation about the structure of government. Second, I listen to a lot of people. Because I wasn't con making my own final conclusions, I do what I normally do. I listen to people who have more experience than me or different perspectives than I do. I spoke with state officials. I spoke with current commissioners here and in other counties. I spoke with former commissioners, mayors, neighbors, elected officials, county officials in other states. And the one thing that was clear to me is that there wasn't a lot of clarity. There was a lot of pros and cons. I heard some weak arguments, but I heard some really strong arguments from people suggesting that every form of government that's available to us has pros and cons. And I thought it was important for not just me to be aware of those pros and cons, but as a community, we all come together and we make a decision with our eyes wide open of some of the challenges. And that brings me to the last reason why I didn't make a final decision. The law states, and I just want to be clear because a lot of people get confused by this, the county commission does not have the authority to enact a change in the form of government. That power is reserved to the people. So what we can do is we can make a recommendation that goes on the ballot, and the people then can vote whether or not they want to approve that plan. Now, it can be done by a recommendation of the commission, or it could be done by a petition of citizens. Uh, either way, it goes on the ballot and people need to vote up or down. One of the limitations in my view of this is that there doesn't, we can't put all of the available options on the ballot and say it's multiple choice. Everyone, you pick what's best for you. It's just one complete plan and it's, you can put thumbs up or thumbs down. And as a voter, I would struggle with this because I would want I would be frustrated if it, if it shows up on my ballot and I, I see it and I say, well, okay, I might have been open to a change in government, but how was this the one plan that was decided upon? And so the process that, that I'm suggesting today 
is that we can have a very public process. And it does two things. One, it brings some of the best minds together in our county, draws on the resources in our community to make sure that we've fully researched and studied the right form of government. Secondly, it involves the public through a series of public meetings and also survey and polling data to, to make sure that people have a voice in the process. And as a voter, I would look at that as a positive thing because I would then when I have the opportunity to vote on this, if a change is recommended, I can say, okay, you know, maybe there are a couple of features in this plan that weren't my preferred preferences, but I saw the process. I showed up at a public meeting and I was able to voice my concerns and I trusted that it was an independent board that reviewed this and make recommendations. So even though it's not entirely what I wanted, I'm still willing to vote for this change because I think it's an improvement. So in conclusion, I think there are a variety of voices. I think this is an issue that's important to us and for our long-term future. I think there's even a variety of voices among the three commissioners. I bet if we were to all write our name, or, you know, our suggested plans on a piece of paper and put it in a hat right now, we'd have three different plans. And so I'm not asking my fellow commissioners to unite on an outcome or on a form of government today, but I am asking that we unite on a process. Let's enact this advisory board that will create an independent, public, and thorough process to ultimately make a recommendation. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> but thank you for your remarks, Commissioner Ainge. I appreciate them. Uh, as is very well noted in many places, I strongly support a change. Uh, it was part of the, my major reason for running. Uh, I live in unco unincorporated county. This is my local government. And I was very strong in my opinions on this when I ran. Uh, I still feel very strongly about it. Uh, speaking specifically to your proposal today, uh, I don't have any problems with it. Uh, if I was to actually highlight some things I really like about it, I like the fact that it's independently, relatively independently established, uh, that it's done through an academic process. Uh, I like the fact that we do have oversight over the committee but that we are not the ones cherry picking the committee. Uh, I know for myself, it would be very difficult to be completely unbiased there. So I like the selection process uh, coming from an outside source that makes it an unbiased process so that we can hopefully get some eyes on this that come into it uh, with a more scientific approach and that we can have the dialogue and discussion uh, on your particular proposal. There's nothing in my statement that I would or in my observation of it that I would particularly change. Uh, the only one thing that I might uh, ask is that on the section under the requirements C that the advisory board shall deliver its report and recommendations to the board of commissioners by May 31st, May 31st, I would actually ask that we include in that verbiage change on or before. Uh, hopefully giving that, you know, if they can get this put together in a quicker manner that they would have the opportunity to report before then. Uh, I realize that, that this is a, a time sensitive matter as we look towards the 2019 ballot and such. And so I would prefer earlier, but I would just, that would be the only suggested change I would make would be on or before May 31st uh, with the anticipation that they could hopefully get it done sooner if, if they were able to get through their process uh, and you know, not necessarily restrict them to a sooner date, but try and encourage that. And I think that, um, just to, to clarify, I think that that, um, while your suggested change specifically addresses that, it, it's basically already built in because it's by, but I, I would be okay with, with those changes to specifically address it. Yeah, and that, that would be the only, only concern or change I would put forward. Great, and I'm, I'm also in, in favor of this. Um, <clears throat> As I've had the opportunity to to serve uh, and and see this this form of government, it's it's obvious that this that I'm more familiar with with the county commission form of government than uh, than the other form in a county, uh, you know, either under a mayor or, or or mayor council form or a manager council form. Um, not having served in that, so I, I I would naturally know a little bit more about this form than the others. But all along, even through the campaign process, which we both went through, um, I stated over and over that we needed to have a, a complete study, that this is a serious matter of changing. I didn't want to have whiplash government where we're going back and forth because of uh, uh, being concerned about 
or just about on personalities or on, on preferences. And, I, and so I'm fully in support of going through a, a process that, and I, and I also recognize that, that the petitioners, they, they hold the front seat. And I wanna state that, they, they do. They don't have to make any changes or do anything um, different, even if this board does come forward and say, here's what we have and here's what's, um, what's, what, what the conclusion was. Uh, and so I, I recognize that, but I think that going through this, at least with the, with the public and, and going through it with individuals who, who hopefully will do it in an, in a, in an academic, uh, thoughtful, deliberative, data-driven, uh, defensible way will, will give us the best form. Because I, I don't know. I, I don't know, and I've said that all along through the campaign. If there's another form of government that's better, that will give us more efficiencies, that will give us better representation, that will give us the accountabilities and transparencies that we're looking for, if there is, if, if there is a form like that, then why would we not go that, that direction? But without, without analyzing it and studying it, I think that we find ourselves a little bit, you know, going off of uh, just a thought process or, or personalities. And I, and I see that even on, on social media, a lot of misinformation out there on the county form of government speculation um, on on how it works and how it functions and so we there's an education process that I think a lot all of us have to go through to a certain extent to understand where it's at I so I too uh, uh, in looking at this proposal itself there was a the, I had I had listed the same thing I want to make sure that we had language in there yours was to shorten it I wanted to make sure that we had the ability to extend it if needed to and the reason why is because if we're gonna do this the right way, I don't want them to shorten it up just because they're trying to hit a deadline. If they had had the ability to extend as well. Um, that was just just for purposes of making sure that they have, they're not trying to cram something in and not having it done right. The second one is under five, under the budget. It says, Utah County Board of, of Commissioners shall provide financial support to the advisory board for the purposes stated herein. Necessary expenditures required prior, prior approval of the advisory board chair and a majority of the board of commissioners. Um, so that's, there's dollars there, which I'm fine with. Uh, they're gonna have to have some resources to go forward with. But we did not budget for any of this. There's no budget line item for it, nor do I know where we're gonna pull this from necessarily, or is there caps on it, or is it built-in caps because the commissioners you know, ultimately get to say yes or no to it. That's yeah. I think that on, on the first point that you raised, Mr. Chair, the um, it would be the same comment that I had to Commissioner Ivy on his recommended change for timing, which is it's already built in. You know, one it said by, so that is prior or, but I'm I'm happy to specifically address it on, on your timeline request. It says that the the requirements, if the committee were to um, come together and of their own volition feel like these requirements or this deadline was not going to work, they would have the ability to seek an amendment. Fair enough. And so that's, al that's already in there as well. Uh, we could specifically address it, but I feel like it's in there at the moment. Okay. And on the budget? And then on the budget issue, I do feel like that is the cap. The cap is that, first of all, the chair has full control, so the other committees don't have the right, committee members can't spend anything. The chair has control any and every individual expense has to be approved by the commission. So I think that's the capping. In terms of where the funds come from, I, I agree this is not a budgeted item, but um, I think that we're talking about a, a relatively small amount and we can find um, the funding and a couple of items that have already come up this year that we know I, we're not going to need. So I can tell you we have our discretionary account. I personally in my own commission budget account have a, have a travel fund. Uh, that because of some scheduling conflict, I know I won't be making one of my NACO trips. I'd be happy to volunteer some of that money to, to go towards this because I think it's, this is a critical discussion and I don't anticipate it costing much more than that. Okay. Yeah, I just wanna make sure we had that discussion because it's kind of vague. Uh, well, it seems there's questions there. All right, um, any members of the, are, are we, are we good to ask any members yeah. of the public to come? You bet. Any members of the public that would like to speak to this? Yes, you can. 
Looks like there's a few. Come on up, whoever. Make sure and state your name. Hi, my name is Carol Ferguson. And I was wondering if a part of this discussion would be if you decide to stay with commissioners and increase the number, if the commissioners would be elected at large, representing the whole county, or as a single member district, each commissioner representing a certain district, and therefore constituents would know who to go to to voice concerns. Thank you. Hey, we don't know. So I, I, I think you said if we, if we uh, increase the commissioners, if you increase the number of commissioners, I'm not clear from that, what it says here. So the state doesn't allow that right now. Okay. I wasn't clear from what it said here. If this is strictly the mayor council being investigated or oh, if all forms all. are being it's investigated. All forms. And I can speak to that. So, so okay. any, any expansion, whether of any form expanding mm -hmm. the numbers is contemplated by the study, what, what's best and a specific thing the committee has asked to study is geographic districting okay thank you should that we do that and what the district should be so okay yes. thank you look my name is richard yossi i live in provo i just want to thank the commission for setting up this advisory board i think the change of government is a discussion that we've needed for a while and i like that this is going to be an open and transparent process where we get um kind of a collaborative end goal that has a lot of people involved and the public can weigh in so that it's just not, um, here's one option on the ballot, how did, it, how did this get arrived, how's this the best? And so I commend you and look forward to seeing what the advisory board comes up with. Thank you. Thank you. Carolina Heron, um, I'd just like to thank you for the time that you've taken to look into an advisory board. Um, I like the way things are written. Um, I'm also a supporter of the change of government, so I think it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, it's been discussed for years now, and it was discussed during several, well, multiple of your campaigns. Um, also, I'd just like to point out that the way it's written now, it gives a time frame that I think needs to be stuck to. By May 31st, on or before, as it was mentioned by Commissioner Ivey, I think is well put, and it's plenty of time for us to be able to come to a consensus. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Chad Pritchard. I'm a resident of Provo, and uh, I too stand in support of a, a change of government. I like the, uh, the advisory board, but I, I encourage that we, we keep to the, the timeline. I think our county is growing so that we can no longer continue with a three-person uh, commission. Um, it's like trying to shoot skeet with a rifle when we should take a buckshot approach to it and we should uh, use uh, as much necessary um, representation as possible. Three people in a county of over half a million is, 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 is too small. So I appreciate that for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? All right, a motion will be in order then. Okay, I'll move that we approve regular agenda item number one with the note of change to section eight, that it, sec, section eight, subsection C, that it reads on or before May 31st. I second that. I got a motion and a, uh, a second to approve agenda item number, adopt, uh, approve agenda item number one. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3 0. Okay, number two. Always oh, track number two. All right, number 10 is to adopt property tax actions contained in the recommendation letter. I believe there was two that were on there. And one of them, let's see, where's Paul? There's Paul. Paul, come on up. Let's start with, uh, with Franklin Schools. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Board of Commissioners, Paul Jones with the Civil Division of the Attorney's Office. We have the Franklin Schools Foundation. Uh, the Franklin Schools is a charter school, and uh, they have a presence here in the first couple rows of your chambers this morning. Mm -hmm. I do believe that they have one or two people who would like to speak to this item. Um, as way of background, um, 
There are a number of issues here. Uh, Franklin Schools is a charter school. Now, charter schools are tax-exempt entities, and there's no question about, about that. The real issue here is um, the point in time that they gained ownership of their school. So charter schools um, typically are usually owned and built by a private developer. And then at some point after the school is completed, then the school entity takes ownership of the school. Uh, schools, unlike most um, building projects, they do not get a building permit from a city. They go through the state to get their building permit. And so um, Utah County was not notified by the building permit process like we usually are that the school was being built. Um, so the school was, was built over a number of months and as it, as it builds, it increases in value. And as it was owned by a private developer, that the increase in value was taxable at that time. Um, right about the time where the school was going to close and take ownership of the property, they contacted the county um, to get an idea of, of the, the tax uh, implications. And that was the first time that the county was aware that there were improvements made by this developer. And so the county at that, at that point in time got, got an assessor out there and assessed the school value and, um, and then assessed the school. Uh, Jim Stevens is here. He's got the timeline better than I do. If you, wanna, if you want to explore that, uh, we may have to call Mr. Stevens up here. Uh, to help us with the, the timeline of it all. Um, and so now uh, the school owned it, and right in there around closing, technically maybe right before or right after, or right before the deed was recorded, um, the county assessed uh, the property. I think it's close to $200,000, $187,000 in property taxes. And so now, uh, now the school owns it, and we recognize they are tax exempt. This tax w is applied for the period of time that it was owned by the developer, and now they're asking uh, for tax relief because because they're a school and they're a tax tax exempt entity. Um, I did follow up uh, with county departments on whether what has the county's historical treatment been of uh, taxing charter schools. And uh, the county has been consistent uh, with taxing the developers on the charter school. In fact, sometimes the charter schools even rent well beyond the time that the school is completed. There's a school in, I think it's Pleasant Grove, Quail Run Charter School. They're still paying property taxes and they've been an ongoing school for a number of years because they don't have ownership of their own school building. It's owned by a private developer. And um, you'll see uh, Chris Paulson himself is the, is the assessor who uh, provide the recommendation here. And he, he kind of states the standard that, that we all understand, which is that uh, charter schools are tax exempt after they gain ownership of the property. Do you have any questions for me? I have some questions for you. Okay. Um, have we closed the loop on on um, since the state is the one that gives the permits and we don't know about that is there a way that we can close that loop so we know when permits are issued so we don't wind up in situations like this in the future I don't have any information on that without we'll to check with the assessor's office to find out if they can reach out for that information or something I don't I don't know Chris do we know or Bert do we know if we His voice carried pretty well. It might have been picked up. <laughs> we, Chris Bolson, County Assessor, we do plan on, on annually, not monthly, but annually uh, contacting the entity that issues the building permits going forward. But it is not a standard practice at this point, nor was it a standard practice. 
if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Uh, it, it's, I, I, so I, I see a potential um, situation where um, we could go years and years and years without knowing and then all of a sudden come back and now we're after five years of back taxes, I think, which they allow us to go back and collect. And we, sometimes that could be enough to say, okay, we're going to put the school out of business. And, and that's a very good point. We are in the process of implementing a, uh, a new package, a new software, which part of it was uh, approved in the budget. And I'll be talking with Commissioner Ivey about how we're going to implement this. But it actually takes aerial imagery that we have taken every two years and it compares it with the prior imagery. And then every two years, we will be going over every single parcel in the county to determine if something has changed. And so that is our backup method in case we've missed something so that it doesn't perpetuate through the system as you just described could happen. All right, can, can I ask, so I'm not sure I follow the, the relevance because I thought that the issue was it's not so much not being aware. Obviously, it would certainly be helpful for us to be aware of what's happening. But I think what I heard was that it's clear that if, whether we're aware or not, as soon as the charter school takes ownership, if the tax exempt entity takes ownership, they're not responsible for any taxes from that point forward. It's, it's really the taxes that kind of have accrued or built up prior to them taking ownership and how contractually it's handled of who's who's responsible because there is a taxable piece prior to a tax exempt entity owning it right and that needs to be taken care of and our our law says that it's taxable up until that point right am, am i correct that in my understanding there you are correct in that um however the reason the title company contacted the county was determined if they could give clear title because there were no back taxes owed and by code, it requires that the property is taxable underneath uh, during the period of time when the developer owns the property. So there's another piece of code that also talks about escape property. And that is what this would fall under is property that was not taxed, but should have been taxed under the current code is identified as escape property. And so Based on all of that, um, the tax actually does follow the property, not the ownership. And because there was a previous tax that should have been taxed but was escaped by code, it is then attached to the property. So that is why the title company wanted to clear this up. So if their intent was to provide clean title, but there cannot be any liens on the property to provide clean title. So, Paul, I got a question for you, um, and, and it goes back to past issues that we had. Um, is, this, is this their process? Is this the process for charter schools to go through in which they typically will have a contractor build it by contract, by contracts they state that they are uh, that that they are you know working towards owning that piece of property or bonding for it into the future and so as the tax exempt status organization this is their process you know where i'm going with the process statement because we've already had that taken to the tax commission and because they obviously had curb and gutter and they had a building built by 20, by january 1st of 2017. yeah um so this is their pro I'm no expert, but my understanding is that uh, charter you know, public schools, when they get built, they're, they're owned by a tax-exempt entity the whole entire time. Charter schools, when they're built, they're not built by a tax-exempt entity. And so even though construction had begun, certainly by the time this tax was assessed, they weren't owned by a tax-exempt entity. And so even though it was for an educational purpose, which is a qualifying purpose, they're not owned by an entity that is uh, I'm allowed to receive tax exemption. So th they're owned by a, a private for-profit land developer. So even if they have a purpose, like a, 
with. Like education is a qualifying purpose. It, it doesn't matter when construction began or the construction process because they're a for-profit company. You, you, um, you have to be a not-for-profit or governmental entity and have it um, exclusively used for a qualifying purpose to qualify for the tax exemption. Does that answer your question? See yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, but it's, <laughs> really, it's really murky though because yeah. I, I, would, I would like to hear what they have to say in the way of how much, what, what contracts they fill out in the way of purchasing of this property. I mean, maybe technically they're not the owner, but I'm wondering through contract if if they have signed that they are, the, I mean, this they're going to be purchased. I mean, they're not building this building just to turn it over to the developer. It oh, is no, a process no, that they're going right. through to own this outright. Yeah. And and, and that process is, is my concern because, yeah. I mean, we've, we've, give, we've given that to vacant pieces of property because of a process in which they go through. They are tax, you know, tax exempt organizations. Right, but um, only because they were owned by tax exempt organizations. I, yeah, there's no question in this case that the private developer owned it, and I'm sure they had a contract to, to purchase it at some point. Um, there's no question about that, that the charter school had, had contract with the developer. The full intent was to have it as a school. Yeah, there's no question about that. Paul, if, if our entities had all been aware and if their contract had been clear that the developer is responsible for taxes during their period of ownership and the charter school is responsible for taxes during their per period of ownership, would this be an issue? There would be no issue. It would, it would be pretty clear. So, yeah. so whether, whether it's a process of somehow legislatively addressing what happens when tax exempt entities are in the process of building or whether it's a contractual process where it's clear, I think there's a way to avoid this problem in the future. So, so that, that brings up the question then, why are we going after the school for the taxes and not the developer? Well, because the taxes follow the property. Right. They didn't oh. own the property during those two years is what you're saying. <clears throat> right, yeah. No, the school did not own the property during those two years. Why the are we going after did. the school then for the, for the taxes? Because they own the property now. See, the taxes follow the property. Who are, I see. You know, so so if you buy a home tomorrow, and there's outstanding taxes on it, now you, now you owe the taxes, mm -hmm. even though, the previous owner but had incurred any, the taxes. But contractual we, we, pr provision, right? And and so in this case, is there no contractual provision for the, for the tr the right. property owner to look back to the developer since it related to their period of ownership? Um, we could look into the contract issue. Now, uh, certainly the school could go back on the developer and say, hey, these are your taxes. My gut tells me that, that, that the school's contract with the developer says that the school is in charge of the taxes. That's my guess. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So usually a developer is going to say, yeah, we'll build, you, we'll build you this, but you're going to pay us X number of dollars, which would include okay. the increase in property tax. That, that, that kind of sways an argument that if you're paying the taxes, you have a, even though you don't technically own the property, <laughs> you have contractually some ownership in that property. Well, no. I mean, I mean yeah. landlords do that. You know, the triple net lease through, you know, all commercial property is pretty much leased that way, where the developer says, we're going we're gonna to lease you the property. You're in charge of the property taxes. But it, yeah, but, but if we were to go back it. to the taxes, we would, would we go to the leasee for that? We'd go to the owner. We'd go to the owner. Yeah. Unless there's a change in ownership because the property always follows the... The taxes always follow the property. So, so how, do we, how do we then, um, when, when they came, when they're going through their bonding and, and, and they asked for, you know, what taxes are owed on this thing, did we only tell them there was $5,000 that was owed on taxes? So Mr. Stevens had a discussion with the um, title company, and, and he said, uh, from my understanding, in no unclear terms, you need to let the, the parties know that there will be a significant assessment on this property. We didn't know about it until they had contacted us, and as soon as they did, we informed them before closing that there would be a substantial tax assessment. And that assessment, you know, the timing is all, it's all bunched together within about two days. Um, the closing, the, the tax assessment, and the recording of the warranty deed. Um, but, but Mr. Stevens did let the closing, the, the title company know that um, there must have been an escapement here. 
there should have been an assessment, and it would be assessed, and it was assessed within a couple of days, I, I believe. So the title company knew there was a hundred and eighty thousand dollar back taxes that needed to be. Paid. You know, for sure they knew that there would be a significant assessment. I don't know if they knew it was one hundred and eighty-seven exactly, or you know, I, I I hate to speak about what the title company knew, but Mr. Stevens did email them the documents. Um, just to make matters that are already pretty complicated more complicated, um, I just discovered yesterday that the school is actually owned by an LLC. Now the LLC, from my understanding, only has one member, which is the chartered organization. Um, and um, if the tax was assessed after um, you know, closing or after the recording, you know, there may be some question about whether the, uh, the county had a right to assess that tax. Uh, from what I've been able to glean just um, yesterday afternoon and this morning, it looks like that assessment hit before the warranty deed was uh, recorded, but it's all very close. Kind of what Chair, I'm getting at there is... I didn't follow any of that. I'm sorry, I didn't follow. I didn't... I didn't oh, okay. Yeah. Well, if, um, if the property had already changed hands before the tax assessment hit the property, there would be... Th there's some question about whether or not the county could legally... Um, trigger the uh, the escaped assessment onto a nonprofit tax exempt entity. Oh. If it was before, then there's no problem. If it was after, maybe it's questionable. If that rationale is something you're interested in, I would recommend continuing for two more weeks so we can really get the, the time frame done. If you're inclined to move on something like a Best interest scenario. I think there's some be some best human interest scenario in this particular case. That right, that's up to the board. So you wouldn't need to wait for that kind of analysis under that under that case. Right, and I, I appreciate the analysis on the trigger because I think it's critical. But I also think for trying to deal with this for me personally in a timely manner, uh, I think there is some best human interest that we need to consider as we debate this particular topic. I agree. I just want, yeah. So so sorry, I'm not. So what you're saying is it needs to be voted on now? Well, I'm just saying that I think that one of the things we can certainly discuss today if we decide and that could potentially lead to a vote today is one of the exemption options we have is if it serves in the best human interest uh, to exempt this particular entity from this tax. Well, five and I think there's a case to be made in the interest of education, particularly in a public education setting, which a charter school is, that there is probably sitting in one of these first two rows a medical doctor that's going to save somebody's life in the future or, you know, create a great contribution to society because of the education that they're receiving. And in America, we believe in the educational process because of the human interest and benefit that it brings to society. That's why we established a public education system. And so I think in this particular case, there's a great human interest in exempting this tax because of the benefit that it brings to the community. And, and I, I would agree with that sentiment. I think that um, another argument I might make, though, is that um, I don't want to put the burden on educational institutions to have to seek an exemption if they're really the way it was already done or the way it could have been done this time made it clear that they get that exemption and we don't have to grant that. And so that would be the reason why I would suggest uh, continuing it, whether you look at the contractual argument or you, whether you look at the argument that you just said that there's some ambiguity about the timing of this deed processing, that they might end up in the same outcome before even granting this exemption. And in my view, that might set a better precedent because then it is pretty clear to future developers and, and charter schools to say, this is the way that you do it to make sure that your tax exempt status is honored as a property owner. So, of course, you know, you know, that's more of a technique. You know, the, that argument would say that the county made a mistake to the point that they're tax exempt. I mean, you know, um, you see what I'm saying? That the technicality here is that we didn't assess them until they'd already changed hands. When we're actually trying to get that assessment on the front end, mm -hmm. that's, that's the real solution here is to get the tax assessment done 
earlier so everyone's on board and they know about and it. I, and, and I think for us, there's a cleanup process that makes us on board earlier, but in this particular case, I don't know that there was a particular county error. Uh, Chris Paulson, County Assessor again. I was just sitting next to the, the uh, deputy recorder and we were going over the timeline. So just for clarification, um, it appears that both the additional assessment and the recording happened the same day. Uh, the recording of the transfer and according to the simple file document here, uh, it appears it happened at 2.34 p.m. and the additional assessment was actually submitted and into the system and approved on 9.30 that morning. So both events happened the same day. But the additional assessment did go in the system prior to the filing of the name change and the warranty deed moving title over. By a couple hours. Yeah, we're just talking a few hours. But that's the time. That's right? the reality. I just wanted to clarify that since it was a point of discussion. Is there, is there, any, is there any amount or is there any deadline um, or kind of negative consequence to the parties involved for waiting a couple of weeks? Penalties. Accrue. The only one I'm aware of is interest. Yep. Interest. Yeah. I, interest. I, my suggestion, I, I, I would move that we, well, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Which, which we, the, we make sure just, the, just yeah. a point though, the commission has the, uh, the ability to waive interest too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, we should let others. For a motion. Yeah. yeah. Please. Thank you. If we could take a few minutes to, to speak to these issues. Um, we're Franklin Discovery Academy, a charter school here in Vineyard. We opened, I, I'm going to just go ahead and go what I, with what I prepared, if that's okay, and it speaks to a lot of the issues that have been brought up so far. Um, so we opened in the 2016-2017 school year, so we're presently in the middle of our third year. Did, did and you we state your name? I'm just wondering. Sorry. Did you state your name? Oh, sorry, Jen Price. And we're, we currently serve 530 Utah County students. So one of the most exciting days for a young charter school like ours is the day it gets to buy its building from a developer. It's all part of the process of building and developing a school and a process that I'll talk more about in a second. We were excited to recently close on our bond on October 16th of last year. The following day on October 17th, as we've just heard, we received a notice of an escaped assessment property tax bill and at that time, the amount was $182,833.67, and it now has some penalty and interest. As you might imagine, to a small charter school, a bill of this size is severely disruptive to the school's operations and budget. We, believe, we are here today to plead our case that it is in the best human interest of the county and the state to abate this bill. This was not a normal property tax bill or a bill on a normal property tax cycle. Instead, it was a bill for escape taxes, but the cut but the county would, had not been aware of our building when it was constructed in late 2016. Because state code does allow for property taxes on charter schools if they do not directly own their building, the tax itself is allowed and we recognize that. If we were still not the building's owner and tried to argue we shouldn't pay any ongoing taxes, we wouldn't have much of a leg to stand on. Our position, however, is that this is not about a normal bill or an ongoing property tax bill but an escaped assessment bill that was the result of a variety of miscommunications or lack of communication. For all new charter schools, the only way to get a building is through a developer. The developer is the first step in a process that leads to full building ownership. The state does not allocate any money for charter school facilities, nor are we allowed to issue taxpayer-financed bonds. As a result, the only opportunity for a charter to open a school building is by contracting with a developer. We work through contracts and negotiations to have them build a building that is specific to our use. Part of that process is an expect expectation of purchase and upfront agreement of the purchase price. Because developer money is expensive, the next part of the process is to purchase the building from the developer by issuing private equity bonds. Unlike school districts where the taxpayer pays for the bond, we pay for our bonds with our allotment money. 
Because the districts issue taxpayer finance bonds from the beginning of their process, they are exempt from day one. Most assessors interpret the code to mean that charters have to wait until they purchase the building using the private bonds before they are exempt. I say most because some, some assessors have decided to exempt charters from day one. We know of two that were built the same year we were that the assessor specifically said, we're not going to assess you from day one, even though the owner was the developer, and even though that the code technically allows them to make the property tax assessment. In what jurisdictions? It was Cache County and Tooele. We don't think that the state's law allowing for us to be taxed when school district, regular school districts are not makes a lot of sense, but we recognize it's a flaw in state law and not county law, and, and that you're not in, in a position to change state law. We are here, however, to ask that you use the authority you have to make a decision to abate the taxes based on it being in the best interests of the state and county to do so. Two weeks ago, I attended this meeting to make sure our appeal would be postponed until today's meeting. It was a pretty interesting meeting. It was the Covered Bridge meeting. And I'm sorry, I don't have anything as exciting as their cow poop analogy. <laughs> but one, th one thing stood out to me during that meeting was that each of you as commissioners were very concerned if the county had made any errors in the process as you considered five or six abatement requests. And although it might not be very wise to call out someone that you're asking for help from for a possible error, we think that any errors made by the county are very relevant to our appeal. And so we would submit that there were at least three potential errors made by the county. First, as mentioned, this is an escaped property tax bill, not an ongoing bill, based on the premise that the county didn't know about our building until October 2018, and therefore we had escaped taxes. We submit that the county did know about our building. The county issued a us a health permit on August 16, 2016, and has been in our building at least half a dozen times since. We recognize there are, there are two different county departments here, but we suggest that communication should have been in place between them. Second, as part of the due diligence process for the bond, the underwriter and title company had to verify that there were no tax liens or outstanding taxes on the property. No investor is going to close on a multi-million dollar deal without knowing if there are any tax issues or liens. The bond processors called the county 10 days before we closed on the bond to verify the tax status. This is information I verified with them yesterday. At this time, the county pointed to the online database showing a 2018 assessment of around $5,000. That $5,000 was paid as part of the bond closing. The call to the county prompted the assessor's office to revisit the property and it was then discovered we had not been assessed, we, that we had only been assessed for the land and not the improvements. There were almost two weeks available for the county to notify the title company that an escaped assessment bill was in the works, in which case we could have been in a position to negotiate with the developer or the bond investor. However, the opportunity was gone after closing. Because property taxes follow the owner, it is 100% now our problem without any recourse to the developer or the title company. And I should mention that even beforehand, we did have a triple net lease and all taxes or any responsibility is passed on anyways. It would, would have just been a situation where we could have negotiated it into the bond or something along those lines. We would suggest there was a mistake to verbally tell the title company that the total tax due for closing purposes was $5,000 and then send a bill for $182,000 10 days later. Third, during the last two months as we've been working on this issue, We've discovered that getting a bill for old escape taxes has happened to several other charter schools. In talking with the county assessor, it became apparent that this issue keeps happening because charter schools permit through the state and not the city. And the state is not communicating the building permit information. The county, or the reason we consider this partly a county error is that charters have now been around in Utah for 15 years and have been permitting through the state ever since. We humbly suggest that this communication issue between the state and the county should have been long resolved. Aside from these three issues, we also think our position is different than the average taxpayer asking for an abatement and that we are a public school serving the children of Utah County. We recently visited the county attorney to make sure that the code allowed for you as commissioners to abate the entire bill if we could show that it is in the best in human interest of the state and county to do so. 
He assured me that you have that authority. I can hardly think of any better purpose for public money than the education of our children. Our entire yearly allotment from the state goes to support the educational programs for our student. We have no stockholders. Nobody goes into education to get rich. Just ask our teachers. We are not a regular for-profit company that can simply sell more widgets to earn the money to pay this tax. We are a nonprofit whose sole purpose is to educate children. Further, we are considered by state code to be a public entity. We are on a fixed budget from the state and get a lump sum for each enrolled student. All of our revenue comes from tax money, and so we would be paying this tax bill with tax money. Incidentally, we are exempt from all other Utah taxes, such as sales tax and income tax. As a public school, we are required by the state to spend our yearly allotment of around $6,700 per student on our educational programs. They actually get upset if we save too much and say we're not spending enough on the kids. Our allotment for 2017 and 2018 has long been spent. This property tax bill would have to come from future funds that should be going to current students. A frustrating thing for us as well is that over half of the tax money would go to Alpine School District. It is simply taking money from one group of students and giving it to another. You might think that there are other buckets of money available to us to make up for this inequity, but there are not. This is the part that gets into our contention that the code is unfair, but we'll save that fight for the state. Most importantly, this property tax bill represents the entire funding we get for 27 students for an entire year. This is what 27 students looks like. This is an entire classroom. These are your future leaders of Utah County. You have an opportunity to help us provide the best education we can for these students. Thank you. You guys can go ahead and sit down. We have tried finding relevant tax commission and court cases related to our situation. I'm not a lawyer, but I think we've found three opinions in written findings that are related. First, when in doubt, the benefit goes to the taxpayer. In New Petco versus County Board of Equalization of Salt Lake County, the court said that tax errors, that when tax errors are made, they should be, quote, construed favorably to the taxpayer and strictly against the taxing authority. Next, in another case against the Salt Lake Board of Equalization, the court said in normal tax exempt cases, the claim should be strictly construed, but that there, but quote, there is an ex exception to this general rule that stakes exempting properties used for educational and charitable pr purposes should receive a broad and more liberal construction than those exempting property used with a view to gain or profit only. The reason for this rule is that the state, by exempting property, is presumed to receive benefits from the property equivalent at least to the public revenue that would otherwise be derived from it. We think we provide that public benefit. Finally, in Kennecott Copper versus Salt Lake County, the court said that, quote, a policy of finality in taxation matters. It is because without it, it creates uncertainty once the taxpayer has closed his books. In this same case, the courts quoted a decision coming out of Washington, Tradewell Store versus Sonomish County, regarding an escaped property tax bill. And quote, the assessor had levied taxes based on the value of the land, but had neglected to include a railroad built on the property. When he, the assessor, attempted to levy an admitted property assessment to cure this oversight, this court ruled that it was not a case of assessing omitted property, but rather was a double taxation and therefore improper. This Washington court held that if the tax was paid on the land, this tax bill was complete and the new bill for, was for an undervaluing of the property and not an escapement. Since, since new tax bills for undervaluing are considered double taxation, they are not allowed. As in Washington, Utah does not allow for additional assessments on property that has been undervalued. In this case, the court ruled that because the taxpayer had paid tax on the land, this was not a case of escape property taxes, but of undervaluing the property and its improvements. As in this case, we, are, we paid property taxes on the land and are in a very similar situation. Finally, we know that the commissioners may wonder why we should receive this abatement if other charters in this situation have had to pay it. They say that 90% of success is showing up. 
we've shown up today. We've done our homework. We didn't send a lawyer to speak for us. We believe that the money left with us provides the county with tremendous value. We're not asking the county to change or waive all charter taxes or ongoing taxes, but in this particular escaped tax situation. We provide a classroom and teachers for these amazing 27 students. And so we're asking for this abatement based on human interest. And so we thought it was important for you to see the 27 little humans. You'll be helping and hear directly from their representative, Aubrey. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aubrey Buell, and I'm a sixth grader at Franklin Discovery Academy. I love my school because we get to choose some of the classes we take, we get to learn with hands-on projects, we learn at our own speed and level, our class ch schedule changes every six weeks and gives us variety so we don't get bored, and we get to put on school musicals. I've been a student at Franklin Discovery since the school first opened in 2016. I've enjoyed learning about civics and government with my social studies teacher, Mr. Adams. I've learned about my country and how we became a democracy. I've learned about the different branches of government and how we have government at city, county, and state, and federal levels, each with different responsibilities. The most exciting part about being part of this country is getting to have a say. Even though I'm not old enough to vote yet, I get to stand up here and tell you my opinions. That's really a wonderful thing that not everybody in other countries gets to do. When my mom explained what was happening with the property tax bill the school received and how it might mean less money for my teachers and school programs, I knew I wanted my voice to be heard. It was explained to me that over half of this property tax money will go to the local school district. It will make it harder for my school to hire good teachers if they have to send all this money to students at the district schools. Am I not as important as those students? My mom also explained that the law that makes some charter schools get property taxes is something at state level that really isn't your fault. Someday when I'm older, I want to fix that law. But for now, the law does say you can waive the taxes if you feel it is in the best interest of your country, county, and state to do so. So I'm here to tell you that it is totally in the best interest of the county and state for those taxes to be waived so that my school can invest in my future with great teachers and great resources. What better use for the money does it, the county have than to invest in the future? Investing in me and my fellow Franklin Foxes is an investment in the future. We are your future teachers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, and business owners. I have plans to be a good, productive member of my society, and I need a school that invests in me and my education so I can do that. My school can help me reach my dreams. As members of government, you have the power to help me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Aubrey. Well done. <laughs> yes, uh, well done. Um, Carrie McConnell, um, I um, am a parent of three charter school kids at Pro Freedom Academy. Uh, I also, also have been a board member for years and currently the board chair of Freedom Academy. I'm also a county employee and I am here on my own time. And I do believe that there was a number of good things said um, by Ms. Price on, on a number of things, how charter schools are funded. Uh, this has happened, uh, as it's been alluded, uh, the uh, escape property has happened on, on two different occasions, one at Freedom Academy in 2016, and the other was Quell Run in 2013. Uh, Quell Run's actually located in, in Pleasant Grove. and. Uh, they had an interesting uh, process. Uh, they were they, they were uh, dealt with an additional assessment. They came before the county commission and asked for the same thing for it to be abated, and it was denied. But the um, the thing that, that the commission offered at that time was to have the county assessor look at the value that was placed on that, and actually it was adjusted. Uh, they actually appealed the denial to the state tax commission and was denied as well, because of same things that was uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Jones as well. This is an, not an exempt entity until the time of ownership. Uh, the County Commission did deal with them on a, on a value basis and they were refunded. And I've got numbers if we want to see that, that type of a refund, but they were not waived entirely. 
Uh, Pearl Freedom Academy had an additional assessment on the junior high high school that was built on about on 820 North and, and Independence Boulevard, uh, Independence Avenue here in Provo. And uh, there was some discussion about fighting that as well. And uh, I was on the board at the time and, and uh, we talked as a board and especially with finan uh, financial director there. And some of the same things come up. This is school money very limited money being paid taxes and in our case the majority of that went to the pro school district and uh, it was paid at the time of closing when the school bought uh, that that school and the campuses combined on a bond through some conduit financing through Provo city and so it has happened there is this the county has been consistent in the way how it unfortunately it deals with charter schools and doing additional assessments um, I just feel that yeah, it, it, it is. It was a great hardship to Pearl Freedom Academy. It's going to be a hardship to, to Franklin uh, School. Um, but our hands are tied in the way of financing. It is done by the weighted pupil unit. Uh, and it is unfortunate, but unf it is a reality in the way of how escape property is, is actually billed to the charter school. A um, couple things, uh, I think this, I, I'm, we're going to watch this. I think uh, the Freedom and the Academy and the board and the finance director uh, will watch the outcome. I think this could set a bad precedent to say we will pick and choose on how we're going to deal with escape property. Escape property happens every once in a while just to the normal taxpayer, but it seems to be a very uh, a large balance ends up happening with two years being assessed with both schools, pro freedom and here. And uh, I, I think it would be interesting to see what happens with the outcome. I believe it, uh, timing is very similar to ours. Uh, and if there's, if there's going to be some type of abatement, then I think I would have Pearl Freedom Academy initiate a refund as well. So thanks for your time. All right, any other, any other comment? Can I just uh, re-point re out that um, when he gave the dates on those other two schools, that that goes to our point that this issue should have been resolved years ago, as far as the communication goes on the, from the state to the county on these property tax. And not every situation is similar or is identical. Um, as far as the mistakes that we've pointed out, um, I believe our situation has some very specific elements to it that can be viewed as a unit into and of itself without having to say that all charter schools are in the same bucket of, of um, property tax escapement issues. And so we would certainly appreciate your consideration for this human interest appeal in this specific situation. Thank you. Jim Stevens, Assessor's Office. I just wanted to point out a couple of things uh, that kind of been brought out, but just to clarify, I, we were contacted by the title company prior to closing. We dispatched an appraiser to pick up the improvement. Uh, when I talked to Joyce at Founders Title, I told her that we needed to pick up those improvements and that they would be added to the parcel. And when, as soon as they were entered into the system, I called her. She told me that the transact transaction had not closed. Um, and so I emailed her a copy of a letter uh, detailing the two assessments for 17 and 2018 and a copy of the updated tax notice. And I told her it was important that both parties to the transaction be informed of this. And, uh, I have specific times that are documented as well that the commission wants to see them. Okay. Any other public comments? All right. Well, I'll go ahead. I'm just be brief. Um, Provo Freedom Academy. Clea Harris, um, Provo Freedom Academy. I admire your school. I have neighbors that go to um, to that school. Uh, we're kind of a, a charter neighborhood. We are quite splintered among several different um, schools. I've actually had children attend five different elementary schools and. Uh, two different high schools and 
Um, I've, I've homeschooled. I've, I've done a lot of schooling, and of course, um, children as well. I, I have many of them. Um, I would hope that we as charter schools would band together to do what's in the best interest of the school um, and, and what's in the best interest of the, of the children. And I hope that the commissioner and the commission won't um, make their decision based on precedent, but most what's in the best interest of, of the children. And uh, going forward, um, I, would, I would hope that we could um, stand together and that um, any other charter school might uh, look to this as a success, not as a blight on um, past decisions, but that this is an uh, indication that, that charter schools are being treated with greater um, equity uh, going forward. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any others? Okay, we'll, we'll close that, the public portion of, of comments, and we'll bring it back up here to the commissioners for um, discussion and further comments. Um. I can, uh, obviously, I think there's some human interest in this. Uh, Commissioner Ange, you did allude to the fact you'd want a continuance. Uh, that is something that, as a standing rule, I'm generally more than happy to oblige by. I would make public note that if we do move that way, that we do have the capacity in our final decision to waive any additional interest that would be incurred. So while it might be a, a delay in the final decision, uh, it wouldn't necessarily mean that it's costing you more money. That, that's my only thoughts. I obviously, I think I made it pretty clear. I think there's a human interest in this case. And I don't disagree with that. I think there's been enough ambiguity about the, the mistakes that um, are alleged to have been made to look into it and make sure that we have the right approach here. I have not done that as much as I should have. So I think that I, I would like to continue it. And I think that, I think the presentations made were um, great. They really articulated uh, the points that need to be made by the by the charter school. Um, one additional point that I think is just explains one of the reasons why I think we want to look into this and why a direct abatement on human interest is not necessarily the best outcome is that the point was made that money could be taken out of the hands of the charter school or taken away from kids only to go to, to another school. But in the event that it, it is not taken out of a tax exempt entity, um, and this was amount that's owed by a private landowner or developer, that's money that could have gone to our school kids and would go to the school district. And it doesn't take away from the kids at the charter school. And so I, I wanna look into this, especially since it's happened, I wasn't aware of the previous issues on this and just make sure that we have an approach that um, not only addresses this specific situation but also makes sure that our assessor our attorney's office that everyone is kind of coordinated you know on, on how we approach these things in the future yeah um, and those I agree with both those points I don't have any problem with continuing it for two weeks so we can get further clarification or, or at least better understanding on it as well uh, but I, I, I do tend to lean towards the human interest on, on this situation for a couple of reasons. One, um, just because it legally can be done, and it legally is that direction, if, if we ever change anything, it usually comes from standing and saying, you know, we're going to do it a little bit different, and then that changes the dialogue. And it get, maybe gets us into a process where we have more communication and more cooperation and understanding of what the process is. And so for me, when I look at, when I look at that, because process is important, I hate to go down the, down the line and all of a sudden fall off a process because we don't understand it or we don't communicate it properly. And so there's, there's, it's, it's concerning that, that we don't have that in place and it's been out there for a long time and not, not been taken care of up to this point. Um, and so I, I, I too would like to, uh, to understand a little bit better um, but I do kind of, I, I do tend to lean towards the, the, the human interest part. There was a reference to a 90% or whatever it was that, you know, that, that we should, we should look at the, uh, the taxpayer in this, in this case, it would be the, the, the school who is doing a great service to, uh, to some of the, the children there. And I think we have an obligation to, if, if that money comes back, what is the highest form of u the use of that money? And, and where does, where does it go? Is it, that's, that's our obligation to look at that and say, what is the best the best way that it can go and so we um, I'm, I'm fine with continuing it for uh, for two weeks do you have a problem with continuing it for two weeks 
Yeah, we, if you're fine with that, commissioners, that would be fine. Jen Price, I know you've indicated that you'd potentially waive any interest over the next two weeks, but we've actually, um, we submitted this request back in November, and so we've had to put our entire budget on hold since then um, in order to try to get this issue resolved. And we've, we've um, the two weeks is important to us, and um, our appeal is based on the human interest, which won't change over the next two weeks. I think after that human interest part is considered, and I think the commissioners have enough information to consider that today, because it purely boils down to the 27 kids. That's the human interest. The fixes that need to happen in the system, those need to happen at any point and need to be looked at, this, that whole process of how these mistakes can be made or are made and can be fixed is something that can happen after a vote takes place on the human interest angle of this situation. And it's, it's these 27 students, we're still gonna have them in two weeks. Our, we're all waiting um, since November when we first submitted the application um, to have the human interest side of this considered and for resolution for our teachers, for our students, for our staff, we would encourage you to consider and make a motion um, today on the human interest part of our property tax abatement request and then deal with how we fix the county processes, whether or not we, the county wants to be like some of the other assessors and just not assess property taxes on charter schools or however the county wants to approach that situation um, but again we've got 27 awesome little Franklin Foxes here um, to learn about government to learn about how you can use that authority to help them and so we would just make a very strong appeal um, that the human interest component that this is in the best human interest of the state and the county for us to have this money to educate our students with thank you and, and thank you, thank you for that. We we have um, through our process as commissioners um, had a kind of an unwritten rule. If there's a commissioner that would like to continue it for two weeks for further information, because they will have to vote, and and, and stand by that vote. And it's I, I, at least for me, uh, it, you know, if, if that's if that's been asked uh, from a commissioner, uh, I think that it's important for us to to uphold that for our for our processes of understanding as well. It's and I appreciate your comments, but it's critical to me to yeah. to keep that standing rule because it's yeah. it's for the better governance of the county as a whole. Yeah. And I'm happy to continue this. Okay. I'll, I'll move that we continue it for two weeks. Second. I got a motion and a second to uh, continue this uh, item number. Oh, well, no, no, just the, uh, the Franklin School part Franklin of School portion number 10 of for two weeks. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0 for continuance. The second part of number 10. <clears throat> the second part is a personal property tax, and um, the owner lives out of the country, and um, it's a carpet cleaning company. As I mentioned, the owner lives out of the country. He didn't receive the request to file his taxes. It probably was mailed here locally. His friends were in charge of the company, and um, they did not do a filing, and so they were estimated. And so he's appealing that uh, estimation. Of course, it's, it's too late to, to discuss the value of the property once it's estimated. Uh, the Board of Commissioners can't change the valuation. Um, and so the recommendation was that uh, was to deny. If you have any questions for me, I'm happy to. Kind are, of a, are they asking for the total? Uh, the yes, I believe so. They're asking for taxes, penalties, interest, everything to be abated. Is that correct? 529.97. On this particular one, I know for me, I was very comfortable with the recommendation for denial. There was clearly no county errors. So, 
so businesses have to register us uh, an address. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And that address was registered, and the notices were sent. Yeah, the notices were sent. I mean, his only real argument is that he was out of the country. He's out of the country, but that's but you've got to have an address. We, we would expect to businesses to have oper uh, you know that. processes in place to cover that absence. Or yeah. any other questions? Oh. Motion to be in order. Let's see where are we at. Ten. I can. I'll move that we approve the remaining property tax recommendation as a denial, as stated in regular agenda item number ten. Second. Got a motion and a second to uh, uh, um, uh, approve the recommendations for the second part of number ten, as stated. All in favor, say aye. 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 That passes three zero. Okay, number 11. Number 11 has to approve and authorize commission chair to ex execute an agreement uh, with Nathan, with Nate Seacrest. <coughs> There's two agreements on here. One of the agreements, uh, one, of, one of them has uh, the budgetary impact of 15,000 and the other one, I don't have to get there, I think it's for like 40. Mm -hmm. We uh, we did not we did not budget for for this item. Uh, unfortunately, we did budget for the 15. That's why you see the 15 on there, and and, and not the 48. And so, um, discussion on, on what to do. Uh, I mean, for me, the historical number was 15, and that was where I would be comfortable, especially where we didn't go out to an RFP. I'm already a little uncomfortable that we didn't jump on this earlier and have this go through a thorough RFP process like we did last year, uh, and then just start awarding it to the same individual. So that even gives me a little pause, but I would definitely be very hesitant to go beyond our budgeted amount. I, um, you know, I think that this is, if there's been a budgeted amount, um, for this year, and my understanding is that this individual has already begun working on behalf of the county during this legislative session. I'm supportive of of living up to that agreement and making sure that this agreement is ratified for the 15. Um, I also would not be comfortable right now without knowing where the budgets are coming from and without having had a little bit more of a process for the additional amount. So I would be comfortable approving the agreement that essentially has already been worked on right now, um, and um, not the other one at, at this point in time. Okay. So we, you know, we last year we did the 15. It was basically through the legislative session. We've got about what 30 30 days left. Mm -hmm. That legislative session, if we if we, uh, you know, into the future agreed that we wanted somebody on a year round basis, which I think is advantageous for us to have somebody of such seeing some of the conflicts that we had with um, uh, on the um, appropriations. We, we've, you know, an ask here, and ask here, a bunch of different asks. It mm -hmm. should have been rounded up. Um, that's what, you know, a, a lobbyist usually does for us. And so I see the value of having um, somebody on full time, but I, uh, I'll agree that um, that's for further conversation for us. And, and I don't disagree with that. I think that moving well, forward, um, there is some benefit to us prior to the session, having someone that we can start developing our priorities and getting very organized. So, um, but I, I guess um, I would move, if we're ready for a motion, that we approve the original agreement the, for the 15,000 as stated in item number 11. I'll second that. I got a motion and a second to uh, uh, approve the, the, the agreement with $15,000 in it. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. Okay, number 12. Uh, we've, we've talked about this one before. This is to approve a resolution contributing $25,000 in cash. And it does say here $25,000 in in-kind services for construction <coughs> of a multi-use trailhead. The, uh, the monies, that the cash amount with TRCC did go through our, our tax advisory uh, board. And, and they their their recommendation was was of such, and I think we were all three there, right? Yes, we were all three there. Yeah. Their recommendation was 
that they that they felt comfortable with the, the cash donation there, their hesitancy, um, although it does not apply to them, of the stated up front on the twenty five thousand dollar in kind donation on the other side, they they did not like that, although that's not really part of their of the TRCC board, um, and they asked that uh, uh, Provo City um, pick that up since it's it's primarily their residents that will be a part of the process. So I did ask Richard to go and approach Provo City a little bit more and see if they'd pick up that 25,000 in kind. That's kind of where we're at. Okay, uh, Richard Nelson, Public Works. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, we, we did discuss this a couple of weeks ago and then also at the, at the Tourism Tax Board uh, also about a week ago. Um, we have uh, Jason Allen and Josh Holt uh, from Utah State Parks here as well. Uh, Jim Price from Mountain Land Association of Governments if we have questions that are specific to them. Uh, Mr. Allen met with uh, Provo City about a week ago. Uh, they did receive a, a written commitment from Provo City uh, Parks and Rec to do the landscaping. It would be about a $10,000 uh, in-kind uh, match. Um, they are still asking that we would do the, the additional 15,000 uh, with, with county resources. Mm -hmm. uh, that way they can, it, it's a 50-50 match. So anything that we can show as a local match, uh, the grant would, would be able to be equivalent to that on the other side so it would make about a $30,000 difference on the on the project uh, so the request would be for the 25,000 in cash that we talked with the tab board on and a, and a $15,000 in-kind match uh, from the county for work on the, the facility okay. I'll, I'll just I don't have any problem with the $25,000 cash uh, I think that's it's a great project for us I do have pause on that side. I wish, you know, Provo City or other, you know, we could tie it up a little bit differently. I don't know if we can. I don't know what, what wouldn't happen if we, if we didn't, if we didn't match the 15,000 in kind. I know it would turn out to be $30,000. I don't know what that does to the project. Does that mean that X, Y, and Z doesn't get done? I have no idea what that is or if it can be picked up anywhere else. You know what that 30,000 would come on up. Jason's the brains of this one. So. You already introduced me. You okay. uh, Jason Island State Parks. Honestly, we really don't know. The uh, King Engineering, who was hired uh, to do the preliminary plans, came up with a $350,000 price tag for the, the trailhead. Uh, that was done about 18 months ago. Uh, we really won't know until it goes out to bid and see and see how the bids come in for the ultimate project what that thirty thousand dollars could or could not do would just have to be wait and see according to who was awarded the ultimate bid i wish i had better numbers for you guys than that but yeah it's the nature of the project where it currently stands in, in some ways um i wish we had some sort of policy in place that if the local entity would would match up to what they you know would match their match of yeah. whatever it is it's just we're, we're going to be, I mean, it's $25,000 in cash, and if we went with the $25,000 in kind, that in kind is a little deceptive because it really is $25,000, so it would be $50,000 total on it. Um, I, I just, if it's not as big a priority for Provo, I, I, I hesitate when I, when I see that they're not as interested in it. And, and I understand that. I don't know what the other commissioners think. But well, I, I would I, say I would say one comment that I have is, is, this, is the same, but on our side, maybe stated a different way, is... I, mean, I appreciate that State Parks uh, wants to make these improvements and there's an opportunity for us to contribute as a county um, to the state projects. And I think that I have an interest in continuing to see that along you know, Utah Lake that we have, um, we improve the public facilities that are available. And I hope that we can, you know, as we demonstrate our interest in partnering, that the state also can continue to be a good partner as we improve you know, and maintain some of those facilities. Um, you know, it'd be great if the local entities also want to contribute. And but I think that I'm comfortable with us contributing in this way, and I think it will be a benefit to the public and to the community. I'm I'm very comfortable with us contributing. I think, we're, especially in the location, uh, that this is while it is somewhat a Provo area, it's very much a county project in conjunction with the state. Especially when we look at what we're doing with Utah Lake as a whole. We just recently purchased property on the almost straight across the lake from this site to really get us another access point. And so I think this is just a continuation of our role as the county to work with the state to make Utah Lake the best it can be. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. Appreciate that. Can well, I you, ask you're contributing 75,000. 
the state. Right, isn't the state? Uh, it was fifty thousand dollar match plus plus the one point four nine acres. And then there's also some coming from forest fire and state lands. Oh, yes. Uh, forest, forestry, fire, and state lands, our sister agencies contributing uh, $5,000 cash with some in-kind work. I, I, didn't, I don't have the paper in front of me of what they've been able to do. Yeah. But they came down, cleared all the trees, and assisted the county with some initial grubbing. Can I ask a budgetary question? It was on the agenda item, but are you planning on using parks equipment to do this in-kind work or roads equipment to do the in-kind work? It would be roads equipment, but we build two parks. Okay, so then my question is, is the parks budget currently sufficient to reimburse the roads funds? Yes. Okay, that's why you yep. aren't asking for more tap yep. money for that. Okay. Right. <clears throat> okay. So we're comfortable with going with the 15 then, it looks, sounds like? Mm -hmm. or the 25 when the 15. So I'll move that we approve item number, trying to find it here. 12. 12. 12 on the regular agenda. Second. And that's with the 15 in kind. Um, I was picking up the crows. So with modified for 15,000 in kind with 10 from Provo. Yeah. Just for my clarification, we'd have 25,000 cash and 15,000 in 15, kind. 15,000 in kind, yes. Okay. And I just want to make that is just a contribution that Provo has done. That does not reduce the original scope of the project. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So I, I, I make that motion um, on item number 12 with the stated modification. Second. The motion and a second uh, to approve the resolution as, as stated with the modifications. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see, number 14, we struck that one. Table 18, 19. Um, oh, this is, is Bert here? This is to adopt an ordinance amending the Utah, Utah County government fee uh, uh, schedule. Yes. The question, um, have you done any projections on, on revenue? Usually we usually, uh, you know, beginning of, beginnings of the year, right. we project revenues. And so right. what will this do for, uh, for revenue? It'll be this nominal. Uh, the the the, fee, the the new fee that's on this the schedule. This 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 is also to update everything that's on the schedule. Um, I looked at the current fee schedule and it seemed like there was a couple of updates that haven't been um, put into the schedule that's publicly available through the website. So I'm just kind of covering all my bases here with this update. But as far as the new fee that goes on there, which is the officiator designee application fee, it's going to be fairly nominal. I'd be I'd be very surprised if we realize. Uh, even $1,000 of revenue in the, in the first year. It'll be, it's really just there to cover uh, what little staff time it takes to process the application and the IT resources it takes to maintain a list on the county website. So it's just really, it's a very nominal fee and won't really realize a lot of, a lot of revenue. This is mostly, again, just to cover what little bit of resources are used to process and, and maintain the applications. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Is this just something that can be modified at any point in time? This isn't a, a regular modification schedule. At any time, this, the exact same process could modify these? Yes, any time you can do this. This has to come before us. All right, motion. We move that we adopt regular agenda item number 19. Second. And a motion is second to adopt uh, agenda item number 19. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3 0. <coughs> hey, from my notes, we need. Uh, number 20, we can strike number 21, unless anybody else needs it. And then we need 22 and 23. Okay. So I move that we approve set date, time, and location for a closed meeting and strategy session to discuss the purchase exchange of real property, watery rights, or water shares um, set today at this location following the completion of the regular agenda. Second. And a motion and a second uh, to approve and set a date, time, and location as stated in number 20. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. I move that we approve and set a time, date, and location for a closed meeting to discuss the character, professional competence, or physical or mental health of an individual uh, or individuals uh, suggested for today at this location following the completion of this meeting. Second. And a motion and a second to approve, a set, approve and set a date, time, and location as date number 22. All in favor say aye. 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 Passes 3-0. I move that we approve set a time, date, and location for a closed meeting to discuss pending or reasonably intimate litigation 
suggested for um, today at this location following the completion of the regular agenda. Second. And a motion and a second to approve and set a date, time, and location as stated. Number 23, all in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. Did we strike 21? 24. 21. 21. 21, we need strike. to strike, yeah. We did? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I don't no. believe we did. Uh, is we that not the we same? Didn't. We actually oh. didn't do it. We just we said we needed to do it. Okay, so I move that we strike 21. Mm -hmm. Second. Agenda item number one. Uh, I get a motion and a second to strike agenda item number 21. All in favor say aye. 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 That passes 3-0. There. And we tabled 24. There are no work sessions. Is there any general public comment? Seeing none, we'll move into our closed meetings. And 